you never know where the next bright idea is going to come from. And I think great organizations have figured that out. If you want to innovate, you really have to wrap your hands around the whole problem in some of these yeah. areas. When you give a fire some space to burn and then you come back to it, guess what? It extinguished itself. There's this gap between all the tech that wants to go into classrooms and where actually the schools and educators are in terms of being able to adopt those products. Vegas. From Syracuse in Las Vegas. 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 Join us for the Ed Element 10. All right, we did it. (laughs) Awesome. Welcome, everyone that is watching us on YouTube. Thank you for being here. I want to say, studio audience, can we see some of those signs? I see folks handing this, holding up the signs. I see you. I see the applause. Thank you all for being here today, because this is a day in which we get to celebrate together, have some fun, and appreciate our partnership with all of you over the years. So studio audience, I want to thank you first and foremost for being here, but being a continued partner with us. Education Elements works with K-12 school districts all over the country, and we have some of our partners here today, so thank you so very much for being here. I also want to welcome our guests and speakers today. We will be hearing from Shelly Taylor, a former COO with Education Elements, also former senior leader at Starbucks, but and also is the current CEO of Alamo Drafthouse Cinema in Austin. We will also hear from Michael B. Horn, author, co-founder of Clayton Christensen, Institute and K-12 expert. Also, we'll hear from a wonderful panel that has wonderful leaders, Alex Hernandez, Chantel Garvey, Tony Sinanis, and Dan Bauer will be on that panel. And my name is David Hardy. I'm the managing partner and also VP of People and Culture. I'm also a former educator as a teacher all the way up through superintendent. So I'm equally as excited to be here with you in this moment. If we could, we have a few slides that we just want to share to show you a little bit about education elements experience and the things you should know about us. First and foremost, as a educator by heart and by mind for the past 18 years, I've spent most of my time in classrooms, around classrooms, in district buildings, talking to families and talking to kids about what is possible. And what you're seeing on the screen are some wonderful leaders who think and care about the same things that you and I do. You will hear great stories, you will hear wonderful knowledge, but most importantly, the folks that you see on the screen will be deeply engaging and will really enlighten us about what makes education elements so special and why we wanna celebrate that with you today. As you know, we continue to work hard to think about how we can help schools grow, and how we can ensure the people within them grow as well. We are shaping a more equitable and just future by changing how people design for educational student at each student's potential, excuse me. It's our vision to bring out the best in people and their communities by designing school systems that are adaptable. And there's certain things that we do to ensure that they are adaptable and meet the needs of our kids. First and foremost, we pay close attention to our district partners because We want to listen to their challenges. We want to listen for the context and to create true belonging. We adapt and we adapt for the context of your community and evolve as we learn more and more about you. And our process is simple, but so complex and so comprehensive. Our desire is to create processes that lead sustained change. We wanna make sure that folks work with us, stick with us because they see that we're impactful and helping them meet their ultimate outcomes. People love working with education elements for many, many reasons. Some of those reasons include the fact that we not only help districts strategize, we stick with you along the way to reach those strategies and make sure they come to life. We give you access to an amazing network of folks and resources, and we we have a little bit of fun along the way, which translates to a motivated and inspired team. If you want to learn more about our services, including strategy, equity, 
teacher recruitment and retention, as well as instruction and personalized learning, please feel free to visit our website or reach out to us if you have any questions. But there is one thing that I have zero questions about, and I don't think you will either. The next speaker that you're about to hear from is gonna give us a lot of knowledge and answers. He actually is someone that this short introduction I'm about to give will not do justice because just the leader that he is and will speak to is powerful and inspirational. Our first speaker tonight is Michael B. Horn. Michael is an author and regular columnist in Forbes who writes about the future and current state of education. His most recent book is Choosing College. We also should note that Michael has been a collaborator and follower of Education Elements from its very beginning. And we are so lucky to have him here and we're so lucky to hear from him tonight. Michael, I turn it over to you. Dave, thanks so much. I'm uh, delighted to be with you all today and I, I'm gonna share my screen right now uh, and have a little fun uh, in this conversation. Thought we'd do a little bit of a remix as we look back at the past of education elements uh, over the last decade as they've uh, helped schools innovate for students, grown the people inside schools, both the educators and the students themselves uh, from day one and have a little bit of fun with this because as you said, Dave, uh, you all like to have uh, some fun. I, I know that to be true. Uh, I've had some fun on the stage uh, of past Ed Element symposiums uh, before, gotten to groove a little bit, uh, but lest you think it's just me having a little bit of fun, uh, Anthony Kim also has fun. But what I'd like you to take a look at here is uh, what I affectionately will call, and, and throughout the talk, what I'm going to do is reflect on some of the conversations and battles and dialogues and fun that Anthony and I have had together. This is what I think of as the sock uh, battle. This is where we started both starting to have some fun with our socks. And this was really Anthony's first uh, foray, I would say, into letting his hair down a little bit and having a little bit more fun uh, in the education space. But really, the person who had the most fun of all of this was uh, Giselle Huff, who, who I, I think of as my fairy godmother in the education world. Uh, but Giselle Huff, for those who know, uh, she was the executive director of the Jacqueline Hume Foundation. And Giselle uh, was a is a force of nature and a dear friend of both Anthony and mine. And, and she really brought us together. I, I, the, Anthony and I first got to know each other when I was living in San Mateo. And he would come to my uh, apartment there a couple of times. And I went down to the company he was running then, uh, their, their headquarters a couple of times. And my book, Disrupting Class, had just come out. I had just moved into the Bay Area. And we started to have these conversations about what schools could be and what education could look like and so forth. And then if you all remember back uh, 10 years ago, we were coming out of the throes of the Great Recession and schools were hitting budget cuts and having to rethink how they did operations. And there was a school in Los Angeles, California uh, called Kip and Power. And Kip and Power really wanted to rethink uh, their educational model, uh, not because necessarily they initially thought, gee, using technology to personalize learning in, in blended settings is, is sort of our calling, but in many ways because uh, they said, we have no other choice right now. And so Giselle Huff put up the money uh, to basically help jumpstart education elements and, and, and Anthony and, and he and I looked at this and came up with some ideas and Anthony really was the brains behind building uh, what became the first station rotation model in, 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 in a KIPP network where they created this blended learning model uh, to move students through small group instruction with teachers, give them small uh, opportunities to learn online and then collaborative activities and projects and lifted the school to soaring heights where they were, uh, I think the uh, top three elementary schools uh, in the entire uh, Bay, excuse me, in the entire state of California uh, with a population that was well over 90% free and reduced lunch, 99% uh, minority, and just doing an incredible work uh, for students and, and, and some, some amazing uh, outcomes that they saw throughout. And that was an impressive first start uh, to, to uh, this, this, this work. And people started to get buzzy about it. People started to get excited and buzzwords started to ring out. And then the first conversation that... Uh, really started to come from that is, what should we call this sort of a model that Anthony has just helped create at KIPP? This, I was calling it blended learning model. And Anthony was sort of like, I think it's a hybrid learning model. And so we had this fight of blended versus hybrid and Giselle put 
a, a bunch of resources in figuring out what's the right way to call this uh, this mix of online learning in schools and blended was the thing that won out. And then ironically, obviously COVID has hit now and everyone is calling this mix of in-person and virtual schooling hybrid. So go figure, I guess you won that one, Anthony, ultimately in terms of what the lexicon would be. But there are a few other stages in the lexicon that I think are worth reflecting on because I think they show the evolution uh, of the field of education, of innovation in education, but also education elements uh, itself. And this next one is, uh, we started working with Alex Hernandez uh, and, and Anthony was instrumental in advising us through this work. And you're gonna hear from Alex just after me in, in, in a few minutes uh, on a panel. Uh, but Alex basically came to us and said, hey, there's this field of blended learning growing uh, throughout the United States. What the heck is blended learning? And so we came up with this super uh, primitive first version uh, of a definition of what blended learning was, of students learning in, at least in part in schools with teachers and at least in part through online learning. And Anthony rightfully pushed us and said that definition isn't uh, complete enough. And so we came up with more complex definition over time. And then corresponding, we had all these models of blended learning. Like, how do you think about the taxonomy? And Anthony, always, I remember, we, we would have these fights around, uh, were these taxonomies good? And this was an early primitive one we had. And uh, ultimately, we ended up with uh, this models uh, of blended learning that continue to evolve and create a more coherent framework of thinking about all the different varieties and innovations that you would see on the ground of how educators were taking technology and using them in really neat ways to serve students. And, uh, you know, Ed Elements was at the forefront of really creating, but then perfecting a lot of these models. And uh, even I remember just how uh, intense some of these conversations felt at the time. Uh, and in retrospect, how silly uh, some of them were uh, a, a, as well, because the real big thrust was not what's the modality. It was, are we best serving students and are we helping increase the capacity and capabilities of districts to better serve students? And against that backdrop, a lot of philanthropists wanted to know, how do we make an impact? Where's, where can we best be useful? And uh, one of the conversations that Anthony and I had at that time was, you know, philanthropists seem to really want to invest in technology, but we don't think that's the challenge, right? Like the challenge is, is really investing in the schools themselves and the people and the capacities and, and how they structure and, and, and plan around this and operate and so forth. But, you know, we, we need to get our hands around what is the state of education technology right now? Because if we're going to tell philanthropists that's not the best place to put your capital, we better show them that indeed, you know, there's a plenty of market and plenty of ed tech companies being created. And so in 2011, if I remember, uh, Anthony and I got together uh, after a conference in a, in a hotel lobby, and we might have had two or three drinks, we might have had four or five. And over the course of the evening, we put out on a napkin uh, the education technology, the state of education technology in a market map, you know, from curricula to instructional systems, to talent management systems, to data systems, and had this huge taxonomy where each of these small circles represents a different company in the space. And it's really interesting to think that you could sort of capture the universe of education technology uh, as it was sold to districts was our, our, our criteria, if I recall. Uh, in the state of a napkin in, in a neat little diagram like this and see where the gaps were and weren't. And then fast forward nine years from today and you're gonna hear from Chantel and, and, and Reach Capital, of course, that have been major funders of the explosion of, of, of uh, really neat uh, opportunity, companies and entrepreneurs uh, in this space. But I think this is also emblematic of how just a couple guys with a, a few drinks in hand could quickly build uh, something that was actually pretty robust. And then this became the basis for EdSurge creating their education technology uh, uh, index to track uh, education companies and offerings over time and see how the market continued to morph and turn. But then looking now about how much bigger and more well-developed uh, that world is. And so uh, we were having all these conversations around technology, as you can tell. But then there was this other sort of segue that occurred where technology sort of fell out of vogue a little bit. And people said, no, it's not really about technology. It's like personalizing learning that's so important. And then there this became this ridiculous fight in my mind uh, in education circles between personalized learning versus blended learning. 
And you would literally have people be like, well, last year we were doing blended learning and this year we're going to do personalized learning. And I, for, from, from my perspective, this literally made no sense whatsoever because the whole reason to do blended learning in the first place to use technology was to create more active environments for students and more personalized environments for students where every single child would be treated as a wonderful individual with the opportunities to build their passions and fulfill their potential. And yet all these fights just continue to break out and the whole field said, well, the heck with blended learning, we're all about personalized learning. Uh, and so that's sort of where the ecosystem started to drive. And then another interesting thing I would say happened, and this is probably circa 2015, 2016, 2017, where I think the field realized like, there's just too much jargon in all this. We gotta, we, 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 we gotta relax a little bit on the terminology and really focus not on technology per se. And, and I think education elements really led this uh, movement to step away from sort of the what we're doing to move to the why we're doing it first and foremost. But secondly, to be less infatuated with the latest state of innovation or the latest high flying dream that might have come along. And gosh knows there were plenty of them, alt school, Newton. Uh, there were all these, you know, uh, sort of knights on white horses that would come in in the form of entrepreneurs saying that we can transform teaching and learning. And, and to the credit of Ed Elements that I think started with helping support blended learning environments and then personalized environments. And then in my mind really became about how do we help school systems and the educators in them better be, be the best version of themselves in effect. And really whatever that takes, is it focusing on the critical importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Is it focusing on making sure that we know how to operate and do planning and, and meetings and so forth? And there was a real evolution, I think, in terms of Ed Elements and the work, you know, you had Anthony coming out with the new school rules, uh, really honing in on the practice and the way that you do technology in education and the way you plan operations and the way you communicate with stakeholders who have a myriad of views across districts and become a vital strategic resource to school leaders across the country to help them better operate and unlock potential for their educators, their communities, and the students ultimately. And as I, as I, as I think about that, and, and uh, I'll stop sharing there as I as, as sort of come to my end of my remarks. As I think about that, I, you know, it's less sexy work in many ways that Ed Elements has moved toward, right? But I think it's actually more vital work. And the major insight that Ed Elements has had over the years is it's not about just sort of the latest and greatest. It's about really working on whatever you've chosen to do and doing the work well and right uh, so that you can perfect it. And, digging in deep on the operations, digging in deep uh, to get, you know, get the planning right and not view a plan as a static thing, but planning and all these tips that frankly, Anthony, I, I, I use in my daily life uh, when I'm not working with districts, when, I, when I'm conducting meetings and so forth, I, I find all those tips and techniques so valuable to me it's not sexy, but I think it's where the real work happens. And if we're really to realize the promise of what Ed Elements started with the technology and so forth, I think it's gonna be because we paid attention to the little stuff. We paid attention to the operations. We paid attention to the capabilities of each and every single human being inside of our school districts. And I think Ed Elements is a critical and huge part of that story. And so I'm, I've been delighted to be affiliated uh, with Ed Elements for the last many years in a board role. I've been delighted to be a part of the story from the beginning. I've been delighted to be a friend of so many on the team. Uh, and I've been delighted, Anthony, to have a partnership and friendship uh, with you. And so I got this cool mug uh, in the mail from you all today. Uh, and I've got this swag of the sweatshirt. And so I'll raise a glass uh, to 10 years of Ed Elements, but I'm going to raise a glass to the work uh, continuing because our students in our communities uh, rely on it. And so thank you so much. And Dave, I'll, I'll send it back to you.
Thank you, Michael, for your words. Um, I heard some really powerful nuggets. One, I'm glad you stepped up Anthony's sock game to start us off. I thought that is important. It's good to hear. And I also really love that not only the sock game, you, you decided to like move us to a place where like we need to walk in other kids' shoes and other community shoes in a way that pushes education forward. And the realization between you and Anthony that it's less about the widgets and the latest and greatest things that make things go, it's really a people business. And that's really powerful to hear that it's people to people that make the change for kids. And it's very clear through your story that that is the way to go. So I, I have a little applause and a thank you at the same time for your words of wisdom and for your support in all the work that we do. Thank you so very much for being here tonight. With that said, I think it's important to realize that the work that we do and have continued to do over the past 10 years leans on the wonderful work of not only our current e ears but some folks from the past. So in a second, we're gonna see a short video from two former e ears who have some special words to share with us, Kawhi and Kiara. Congratulations! Congratulations! Happy 10th year anniversary! Hi, I'm Kiara. And I'm Kawhi, and we are co-authors of The New Team Habits. It's one of our gifts for the 10th anniversary to the Ed Elements community is we want to produce some new content around the new team habits. Specifically, we want to create things for school boards and how to have better habits around meeting, learning, and initiatives. So if any of you are thinking about how to deepen connections for your team and use check-in rounds in an even more thoughtful way, we have a six-week check-in training program coming out in the next month. So stay tuned. Congratulations on 10 years. 10 years. Congratulations. Congratulations. And here's to 10 times, 10 times, 10 more. I so appreciate the way that you prepare and bring new ideas and really be a thought pusher and a thought provoker, both for my district and Southwest Ohio region. They are there to assist us and be thought partners with us in any area that we want to improve in. At Elements, Alessa is so grateful. We could not have gone through 2020 without you. I'm really grateful to Ed Elements for the work that you did with us on our reopening playbook. We really appreciate the sense of fun that's brought into the sessions and the importance on human connections. You know, 2020 has been a year unlike any other, and I am so thankful for our partnership with Ed Elements. So thank you so much. Congratulations on 10 years, and I wish you nothing but success for the next 10 years and beyond. Well done, and we are so proud to continue to be partners with you. Thank you. So at this time, I invite you to raise your mug or your glass or your bottle of water. Um, no judgment on what might be in your glass or mug along the way. Um, but more importantly, it's time to toast to 10 years. And I take a quote from uh, a movie that I love that says, it's not the number of breaths you take, it's the number of moments that take your breath away. And hearing the words of some wonderful people about the work education Elements has done over the past 10 years truly takes my breath away. And so not only to the past 10, but to a future 10. Congratulations and here's to the next 10 years. So with that said, I'm excited to now turn to our panel. We will have a university dean, an assistant school superintendent, investor, an author, a podcaster, and a principal. And today's panel will be hosted by our very own CEO, Anthony Kim, and founder of Education Elements. Anthony, I turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Dave. I'm excited to have this conversation, but before I do, I can't leave the conversation without having a few comments about Michael Horn because he shared so much about my socks. What I wanted to share is one story and actually a couple of stories, but Michael has been a valuable thought partner. And in fact, like we have a lot of similarities as well. Like um, 
Well, he lives on Anthony Street, and my name is Anthony. Uh, he's married to a Kim, and my last name is Kim. And so I wanted to recall one of my favorite times working with Michael, and it was actually on the ski slopes where I was skiing with Michael and he was, you know, showing off his one-legged squats and everything because he's a massive CrossFitter. And I took him down a bunny slope and he was all like in pizza formation, nervous, sweating, just hair falling out. And I was just like, that's what you get for arguing with me about blended learning versus hybrid learning. Now I, get, I got my brothers. So uh, I wanted to share that thought, but really I think that what I, I actually wanted to share is I really value the, uh, the thinking that Michael brought to our organization. As we think about disruptive innovation and sustained innovation, the path and pattern that we think about is something that Michael has really put a great deal of influence in the way we think about innovation and where to make bets in terms of where disruptive innovation lies versus where sustained innovation lies. And I think a lot of times we lean towards this idea around innovation where everything has to be you know, disruptive and flip everything upside down. And when we're working in the systems that we have, sometimes sustaining innovation and doing it in such a way that people could adapt and evolve and grow is a, a different way. And sometimes instead of just blowing things up and flipping everything on its head, there's a different approach that we looked at. And so, Michael, I wanted to see if you could just talk a little bit about it, because I think you and Clay Christensen, you know, spent so much time thinking about the differences. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up the point, Anthony, because look, the I, I, I would say like there's been several very unfortunate readings of Clay's work over the years. And one of them is that like disruption is good, sustaining is bad. And in my mind, that couldn't be further from the truth. Like 80 plus percent of an organization's resources and time and planning should be put towards sustaining innovations. Disruption's like the thing that comes along, you know, every so often and not that frequently, frankly, right? And for a really successful organization, you need to do sustaining innovations well. And sustaining are those incremental or breakthrough improvements, but they're, they're like the ways we operate, we're doing them better. And in my mind, if you don't do that, you don't get the license to think about the disruptive stuff. Um, organizations that are healthy because they've been great at doing the sustaining innovations, they're the ones that get to play in disruption. And uh, I'll, I'll take an example outside of education for a moment, but you know, GM, right, in 2008 when they got bailed out, um, I would say the CEO at the time sort of realized, like, actually, we're headed down the wrong path. We've been disrupted by all these automakers from uh, Korea uh, and, and, and Japan. And holy cow, we got to do something about it. But because they hadn't done the sustaining well, they didn't have the ability. They didn't have the cash flow. They didn't have the resources. They didn't have the capabilities to really do the disruption. And you need to have a healthy organization uh, to be able to do both. And, and, and in my mind, when you neglect the sustaining and, and focusing on the operations, you, you, it, you, know, you can't even imagine, or you, you, you have no ability to think about the disruptive. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And I think the other, other question that I had for you is as, as you've been monitoring, you know, so much going on in education across K through 12 and higher ed, and you've seen organizations and companies come and go through that process. I think so many of us, you know, whether you're practicing in a school district or in a school network, or you're an ed tech company, or you're a budding founder, you want, you get into this to solve this like huge uh, problem and you imagine this holy grail that could do everything, you know, the algorithm that could tell everybody exactly what to do and provide the right instruction for every child and having every single piece of data about every child right at your fingertips. Like, you know, that's been kind of the, the vision that people have portrayed in a lot of the work. And I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you see that evolving or changing, or is it something that is even in in the near future or where where does that kind of innovation or change actually happen and why are companies or organizations so unsuccessful at implementing this yeah it's a great question anthony i i 
I confess I've become more and more pessimistic about the oper- like the potential of artificial intelligence to create like the magical algorithm that will show us exactly what to do with a child when. And like, I don't think I was ever particularly on that train, but, but I've become more and more suspect of it. And, and the reason is um, h- humans are incredibly complex <laughs> individuals. Um, there are so many factors that could explain why we do or don't perform well on a given day or on a given time on a piece of software that the software can't possibly track. And, you know, as you said once to me, um, I'm going to quote you, you know, you said like, it's kind of okay if like Amazon or Netflix shows up a recommendation to you that's wrong. And like, as long as their algorithm is 51% accurate or something like that, like they're thrilled, right? Because that, that marginal benefit um, is, is, is valuable. And if like they're, you know, if I'm shopping for air filters, just hypothetically these days, um, and then I buy one and then Amazon keeps serving up ads for me to buy another one, like I might laugh and be like, guys, I already bought it from you, but it's okay, right? Like if there's no negative repercussions. Whereas in education, like there's huge negative repercussions of, serving up the wrong learning content or, or, or sh- you know, creating a narrative in, in a student's mind that somehow they're not good enough, right, for something because they're failing at a task. We gave them the wrong thing or we've taken them back to something that they've mastered that we think they didn't just because they missed, um, you know, they missed breakfast that morning or mom and dad had a fight and they didn't get sleep. Like, you can't track that on top of which you know, for, for artificial intelligence to really work, you need to have very clear rules uh, in place, right? That you can codify and build in, you know, it, it can build into it. And outside of certain domains of mathematics and some quant heavy fields, we, we don't really have that understanding or, or agreement um, of the learning and, and, uh, and, and assessment and so forth. So I'm just not even sure, even if it was a closed system, <laughs> that it's, it's really possible to do it. And so I, I kind of think the more we think like that's the vision, the more harm we're doing to the innovations we could be doing in, 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 in the meantime. Yeah, I mean, I, I know a, for a fact that, um, you know, Facebook serves up ads based off of what my wife is searching for <laughs> online and, and puts it on my Instagram. So, you know, I, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, I, I think the other thing I was thinking about, Michael, and especially now because you wrote actually a children's book recently, but I wanted to talk about your book, uh, Choosing College, because I think everybody is trying to think about how to prepare kids for college and the future. And what are some of the shifts that you see in, in, the, in the space, in higher ed? Like, how should K-12 systems be thinking differently about what we're preparing these kids for, especially in this environment where, you know, many liberal arts schools might not even be around. Uh, Online learning has become more prevalent in this, but also the types of jobs that we're trying to prepare for are just obviously so different now, especially in, you know, the, the pandemic conditions that we've been living through. Yeah. So as we did research for choosing college and looked at, and fundamentally it dissects the, the, the fundamental reasons why people make the post-secondary education choices that they do. I was just struck by, you look at surveys across the country about why students go to college and every single one says, oh, they go to get a job. But then you talk to the students themselves and look at the stories. Like we, we made over 200 mini documentaries of students making the choice they don't know what a job is. Like most of them haven't been in the workforce. We know that this group of teenagers is the lowest participation in the workforce of any, uh, of, of any generation in our nation's history. Um, they don't have a sense of like what their possibilities are and so forth. Um, and so I, in, in my mind, you couple that with how ambiguous and ever-changing the world that they're entering into is, and I came away with the strong conclusions that that K-12 schools need to do a few things. One, they need to spend some time helping individuals learn who they are and what 
and, and how they can contribute in the world. What are the different fields and where does it align with what excites them and allow them to have time to build passion and discover more about themselves? The, the second thing that I, I, I think is critical is you need to help individuals learn how to learn. And like we say that often in a vague way about metacognition, but I think we have to be very explicit about building individuals into you know, developing agency in them so that they can take ownership of their learning because they're going to have to be reskilling constantly in, in this new world and, and they're going to need to be intentional about it, right? Um, and to that end, I don't think college is always going to be like the straightforward destination. I think college at some point for most individuals will make sense, but not necessarily right out of high school and, and helping people have this nonlinear view of the world that we're not in a horse race to sort of beat someone else, right? It's not a zero sum game, but the goal is to find out who you are, how you can contribute and, and, and you know, your sense of purpose so that happiness derives from that is, is more the objective. Um, I think instilling that in, in, in individuals is incredibly important and, and, not, and something that we've really neglected uh, in, in developing in students. Well, thanks for that, Michael. And uh, just to give you guys, the audience, a little bit more insider information. The last argument Michael and I had was about pandemic pods. So uh, maybe you'll see a post about that coming out pretty soon. <laughs> stay, stay tuned for that. I, I can't <laughs> wait to see it. Um, that might go viral. I want to I want to see it. So um, thank you both for that conversation. I'm going to now, Anthony, we're going to turn it over to you to talk with this wonderful panel. Again, we have a, a university dean, an assistant super, school superintendent, investor, an author, a podcaster, and a principal. I don't know if you can have a better panel, honestly. And Anthony, we cannot have a better moderator than you. So I'm excited for this conversation, and I can't wait to see where you take us. So I'll take, let you take it over from here. Well, well, Dave, uh, just sit back and relax. You know, I don't have the moderator blazer on, but you know, I'm going to go with it. So, uh, you know, I, I think what I wanted to do was specifically handpick this panel, and I did it for a special reason. And I wanted to go through a little bit of that um, first. Like, you know, Michael mentioned Alex Hernandez, uh, Charter School Growth Fund, now in higher ed at, as a dean in the University of Virginia. I mean, we scoured for years conference after conference from INACOL to South by Southwest to New School Venture Fund to find that perfect model, to find that perfect school that was scalable and replicable. And uh, there was a lot of fun in doing that, but we found that it's impossible to find that because the context for every school is so different. And so I thought it would be great to have Alex here, great uh, thinker around school models, understands a ton about different approaches to school learn schooling and worked at Aspire Public Schools and then uh, at Charter School Growth Fund. And, and then Tony, not only does he have the same name as me, so I had to bring him in, but also, uh, you know, we both have Twitter followers. He just has like 35,000 and I have three. And so one of the reasons I asked Tony to join us today is to ask his followers to follow me. And, part, and so, no, actually, um, Tony is not only an assistant superintendent in Chappaqua School District, but also a really well-respected author, uh, Hacking Leadership, and I follow a lot of the content that he has. Always been really humble and generous with his time. Uh, I've come to the district a few times, and he just never really let me know he had such a following and a vision for what leadership looks like. And so I wanted to share that and bring him along in, on this conversation because I really appreciate it when people share their time with us and allow us to enjoy and be part of the community that they have. And so I thank Tony for that. And then uh, Chantel, um, we met when Mike, I think Michael and I and Sal Khan were actually presenting at Stanford and Chantel was a student then and it's just been amazing to follow her career through from Stanford into New School Venture Fund to Reach Capital 
Reach Capital is just one of the premier uh, education investors in, in, and has had so many successful and impactful investments. And it's been wonderful for me to see how Chantel has grown her career, but also for her to reflect on how she's seen us as she goes through and navigates the whole ed tech world. And then uh, Dan is a podcaster and he actually, we met when he was in London and he had me on his show and uh, we've actually never met in person. So uh, Dan is a pandemic friend for me and he's now in Syracuse and we just talk about leadership because he runs a, a mind trust in uh, online, I guess, uh, and helps other school leaders think about some of the most important things that they should think about. And so he's joined us. And I wanted to bring a bunch of different perspectives uh, in the story. So with that, I think one of the things that I wanted to have everybody experience in this is something we do. And if you work with Ed Elements, you know we do this for every meeting, and it's called the check-in question. And so the check-in question goes, you know, something within a minute's time. Uh, I would love to just hear from you individually, and I'll call you guys out. What's something I missed in the introduction that you would want to share with this audience? S something personal, some memory you had, or something about yourself that you would want to share? And so... I'm going to start with Alex because he has a grin on his face, and I think he has something lined up. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. I can't believe it's 10 years. And 10 years ago, you should know that uh, we were so uh, excited about personalized learning for kids that Michael Horn, Anthony Kim, and I hopped in the back of a rental car and drove three hours from Phoenix airport to go seek out a school that we heard was doing personalized learning. And uh, that was a, uh, I think that was the first time I'd really spent any time with Anthony or Michael. And uh, it was really just a kind of a fun memory to see how much has grown since that time. Um, something you should know about me, I play uh, Mexican folk songs uh, in my spare time and come from a big family of mariachis. And I was thinking about a lot this fall because I gave a talk uh, about uh, my, my family's history and how it uh, intersected with the farm workers movement in, uh, in the Central Valley of California. So that's one thing you may not know about me. All right. Thanks, Alex. That was uh, very insightful. I didn't know that about you either. I, I also know that you walk around barefoot on campus. And so uh, that's something that other folks didn't know probably either. This is true. All right. Tony, how about you? What, what's something that we should have learned about you? All right. Well, I, I'm an, I couldn't pick one, so I have three, but I'm going to make them less than a minute. So it's all good. Number one, like my greatest pride and joy is that I am Paul's dad. My son is going to be 16 next week. And I can tell you from the moment he was born, he impacted not only my, my being as, as an individual, but my thinking as an educator. So very much helped me center and anchor my thinking as an educator around kids. Second thing I will share is that my, my first language was not English. I didn't learn English until I was about five or six when I went to school. And I learned it not only through school, but because my mom watched all my children uh, growing up. And so I watched it with her. And imagine my thrill when I went to see a Broadway show and Susan Lucci was sitting next to me, I almost died. Um, and then the last thing I will share was I grew up always wanting to learn how to play an instrument. So when I was an elementary school principal, I joined the fourth grade orchestra and I learned how to play the violin. And that was only in the last uh, four or five years. So there you go. Well, another thing we have in common, I learned the Suzuki method of playing the violin. And so there we go. <laughs> and um, Chantel, how about you? What's something we should know about you? Well, first, thank you for, for having me. It's so great to reconnect the team. And like, like you, Anthony was saying, I've been tracking the progress um, over the years. So um, what I'll say a couple things, um, I'm not a um, career long person in the education space. So I am someone who made a career transition. Um, but I feel like it's always been my calling from from early on. So my mom is an educator. She's a professor at Elon University. Education was always important in our household. And I actually owe a lot of my career trajectory to my high school chemistry teacher. She saw that I had an aptitude for math and science. She really encouraged me um, to pursue that path. Um, so actually before this career, I was a chemical engineer. I made Tide and Downey. 
uh, at Procter & Gamble living in Cincinnati. But again, I felt like my calling was, was education. So I moved out to the Bay Area to make a career transition into education technologies, which is where I met um, Anthony at Stanford. Cool. And Dan, what's going on? For greetings from Syracuse, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Anthony, uh, for having me here. I'm, I'm a show and tell guy, so I'm just looking at my desk, what I can grab and put up, you know, on the screen. So uh, I'll just tell you some projects I'm interested in. So I'm really into uh, creating postcards and drawing and sending those to leaders I serve. So here's one right here. It hasn't been painted yet, but the idea is, um, you know, people are going through tough times right now, obviously. And I love uh, just creating like, uh, a title to whatever's happening on this postcard. And it's my hope that when somebody receives it, they'll continue the story, get lost in it, and just forget for a moment, you know, what's going on so that they can get uh, integrated in the story. And so the other thing I want to show you too, um, Anthony mentioned we, we met, uh, you know, in the UK, I guess online, but that's where I was. I lived in the Netherlands and Belgium as well for uh, a few years. And there's uh, terrariums everywhere. So in Airbnbs and restaurants and cafes. And so I'm really into that. And here's just a very small one that I made, but I love it. I love it. You could see one behind me on the top shelf as well. And uh, I have them all over the house now. So those are just a couple of interests of mine. All right, Dan, but like really my burning question is what's up with your Twitter handle? Why is it called Alien Earbuds? It's really just a, a, you know, poor branding and to make everybody confusing. But if you know me, I'm a very unique and creative guy. And uh, I was a former uh, English and reading teacher. I love word games. So if you take my name, Daniel Bauer, and mix up the letters, it's an anagram. It spells Daniel Bauer. So alien earbud, you just, that's how you get it. Boom. Amazing. Amazing. Genius. So, um, all right, so like, I guess, I guess this is a panel discussion and I got a couple of questions for you guys. Um, let's start with Alex. Um, what's blowing your mind right now? Like, how, how is it like, uh, how, uh, what's exciting you? Um, what's something that you're like looking to unpack in the work that you do? And maybe just explain what you do now too. Yeah, sure. So I'm the Dean of the School of Continuing and Professional Studies at University of Virginia. Uh, most of our programs are online. We um, serve a lot of students who are working adults trying to complete their bachelor's degree. So this uh, fall, I actually got to teach uh, for the first time at my school. I taught entrepreneurship to um, adults from a wide variety of backgrounds. And what blew my mind, honestly, was in our last class, uh, people didn't want to leave the community. Uh, they had built these incredible relationships. Uh, Michael Horn actually came and spoke to our class back in September. They like heard guest speakers. And what was fascinating is that you know, many of us have children who you're experiencing online and virtual during the pandemic. And people just had a wide variety of reactions. Like some kids, like they only want face to face, like the online is a disaster. Some folks only want the online. My kids right now are one week on, one week off. If they had a choice, they'd stick to that schedule afterwards. And what we figured out, and I think we knew this, but there's just people like to learn in a lot of different ways. And, you know, there, I think uh, Strata ran a uh, survey of adults and said, how would you best like to learn if there wasn't a pandemic? Four in 10, so they go right back to face-to-face. -to -face. Three in 10, so online or only. Three in 10, so they want to mix. Uh, and you, know, you can't even see it in the same house. There was a mom who came to me who said, well, my kids need and want really different things. And I actually didn't know that until the last few months. And she was like, am I unusual? And I'm like, no, that's almost every conversation uh, I'm having with families. So uh, that's I think really interesting. And, you know, what I think we also came to figure out is that, you know, it needs to be high quality stuff. If it's not a good experience, it totally sucks. And um, what I'm really excited about is all the investment that's going on to make things a quality experience. Like we know that relationships, community, student engagement, we know all these things can happen. They're not the same as face-to-face. -face. They shouldn't be, but they're, they can happen in really meaningful, uh, extraordinary ways, some high-tech, some low-tech. 
Uh, but there's also a ton of investment going on right now to that. And Chantel can tell you more about this than I do because she gets to play, see him play with all these toys before I do uh, and, and invest in them. But there's just so much going on right now, so much investment to make uh, the, the, the virtual classroom personalized learning uh, a really incredible space. And I'm really optimistic about that. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, and I'm I'm actually glad you said sucks because that allows me to loosen up my vocabulary too. So thank you, um, Sean. That's the technical term, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know. I think what's been blowing my mind this year is how hard it is to unpack truth, and especially with the internet, how hard it is to figure out what's true and not true. And to me, that feels like an essential skill. And so, as uh, Chantel, wh what what are you seeing that doesn't suck in ed tech? Um, yeah, I, I think that could be a, a biased question. <laughs> um, you know, I think first of all and, and foremost, um, most people I think right now, um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, were just frustrated, right? Remote learning is not working. All of it sucks. You know, all of it is is not the ideal experience in person. Um, but then I go back and I remind myself and I, and, I, and I ask myself, like, what would this moment have been like without any tech, right? Like if we had no technology and there was no way to even have, you know, these online experiences, these online connections. Um, and so I think whatever we can do to really continue to build those, like, like uh, Alex was saying, build those relationships, um, continue to build community, um, leveraging these tools to really... Um, you know, do things that we can't ne necessarily do in the typical day-to-day -day, uh, school experience. Um, so one of the things that we, we've been very excited about is, again, tools that transcend boundaries, tools that bring different communities together. Um, one that we have that's in the kind of K-12 space is a company called OutSchool. It's a marketplace of live online classes. Uh, and when we invested, they were just serving the homeschool market, right? And so it was parents looking for supplemental education for during the, during the day. Um, these are certified teachers who are doing um, classes on the marketplace. And then given this time, it's just, you know, blowing up. There's been so much demand, so much interest. Again, you have kids sitting, you know, in rural Colorado, connecting with kids in New York, all on a shared experience um, and learning together. And, and again, this is things that probably wouldn't have happened um, without a tool like this or without a moment like this. And so it's exciting to kind of bring those different um, communities together. And then, like you said, there's a lot of just misinformation out there, right? And, and, and during this time, there's just a lot, what is true? Um, and a lot of times you can't just do, um, you know, asynchronous content, you're just reading, you're, you're not necessarily having, um, you know, thoughtful dialogue and thoughtful discourse. And so again, through these synchronous online live classes led by a teacher, led by a facilitator, we are having real discourse. We are challenging each other's assumptions. Um, and I think that's just a great experience that we can have in this moment. And, and Chantel, like, where would you like to see more founders and more uh, building uh, companies that are getting formed? Like, what area are you seeing gaps and what would you like to see? Yeah, there's a lot of gaps. Um, so I think this moment definitely highlighted um, and exasperated all the inequities um, that we're seeing, right? So there were a ton of students who, for a variety of reasons, whether they didn't have access to a device, access to uh, internet, even just a safe and quiet space at home to really uh, interact and, and be um, active participants in remote learning. I think there's still a lot, a way, lot uh, there's still a ways to go in terms of um, making sure that we address those inequities, whether that's through different product tools, you know, whether that's through public private partnerships, um, still it just really showed that there's a ways to go. Um, we've been thinking a lot about what's going to happen when kids return to school um, in, in terms of just their, their mental health and in terms of the trauma that just we as adults have experienced, but even more so just on the development of, of the students and their brains and, and just the, the amount of um, anxiety that this time has caused. And so it's going to be asking a lot for our teachers to not only, you know, make up for all the learning loss that happened over the past year, but also be able to address a lot of the, um, the trauma that, that these students are going to be coming back into classroom with. And so again, if there's tools um, there that can support those efforts, um, that's kind of the K-12 side. And then, you know, I also work, um, I do across the spectrum. So I'm also looking at the higher ed side. And I know you guys were talking to Michael Horn, but I'm just excited also to, you know, I think this is a time and a moment to reimagine what higher ed, what that experience can look like um, and, and create different pathways 
um, that are more personalized and individualized and can be a hybrid of both an online experience and maybe an offline experience. Um, and I've been really look, digging into more um, work-based learning opportunities, whether that's work integrated learning projects, whether that's um, apprenticeship programs. But again, I think this moment is opening up people's ideas to what that post-secondary uh, experience could look like. Cool, and that's a great segue into kind of the next set of questions I had. And this is more about the people, the people at the schools, the leaders at the buildings. And um, I guess, Tony, you know, I think one of the things that um, I, I study a lot is just how people can be pushed and, you know, human potential and what kind of like energy reserves people might have to like be able to draw out. And I think a lot of us are digging deep into our reserves uh, right now. And what I'm curious about is like, what's the stuff that you find your teachers, the folks that you work with needing to do every day to keep sane in this environment and what's keeping them motivated as they try to navigate all this change? So, so that's, that's a great question, Anthony. And um, I, I think it's, it's, there are many of us who are maybe even beyond our reverse uh, reserve tank. <laughs> we're, we're almost running on fumes to some extent um, because this is not just about September to now, it's about how the world kind of changed in March and in some ways how it forced us to pivot you know, really quickly and create online schools right in a matter of days. Not necessarily assessing the effectiveness of them, but just creating that opportunity to engage with kids in, in a moment at a moment's notice. Um, you know, the thing that really stands out to me is, is the fact that people do keep coming back. Right, we have open schools. Our schools opened on September third uh, to to students K through twelve uh, in different iterations. Right, so right now K through eight we're all hundred percent in, and our high school students have a, a alternating alternating schedule. Uh, but a lot of them are accessing their their learning remotely, and the fact that our teachers keep coming back every day, the fact that our administrative, uh, you know, our building leaders come back every day. And even during those difficult moments, they, they, they smile and they work through it because they're committed to making a difference for kids and being there for kids and staying connected to kids and staying connected to each other. Um, and so there's also this sense of normalcy in a totally abnormal situation that being in school brings, right? Because you're, you're in a space you know, you're with folks that are your family away from your family. Uh, you're, you're with kids each day. Um, so I, I, I have to believe based on the conversations that I've had, and I've talked to a lot of teachers in our district, a lot of the, the building principals and assistant principals who I'm blown away by every single day that, like I said, they just keep showing up. And I don't even mean just physically, emotionally, psychologically, they are there, they are engaged, and they have somehow managed to keep humanity at the center of all of this, even in physical disconnect to really keep connected, to think about the soft skills, not just the content skills that we do think about as it relates to standards, but just as we develop as human beings. And that has really inspired me and has, has impressed me because I, I don't know how they do it um, because they're on all the time. Um, and so I, I think they're pulling from a reserve that is centered around kids and, and feeling like they want to and need to be there for kids um, because they're going to make a difference even just by being there and providing a safe space, right? We can't say enough about the importance of emotional safety and creating emotionally safe spaces as it relates to anything, whether it's learning, whether it's trying a new platform, um, that, that emotional safety is critical. And I think we're trying hard as a, as a leadership team to create emotionally safe spaces for teachers, which is not always easy because you want to validate that this is uncomfortable, this is painful, this is, this is traumatic. And I think to Chantel's point, there's, there's going to be trauma that we're going to be experiencing, I think for years to come. I don't know if it's PTSD, I don't know how you qualify or to quantify it, but it's there and it's real. And, and it's not just our kids, it's our colleagues that it's gonna impact. And so how are we gonna take care of each other? How are we gonna check in beyond the, hey, how you doing? If you're not really listening, like <laughs> let's talk about how you're really doing and what we can better do to support you. Um, so you know, those are all the things that I'm seeing um, and, and that ability for the adults to take care of each other has also really blown my mind. Like I see people putting others before themselves, but also naming when they need to be put first, right? Like I need to take care of myself so I can take care of the folks around me. Um, and, and I've tried really hard to empower people in the best of my ability to model. It's okay to say that. Self-care. And sometimes, by the way, self-care might even be a little selfish. It might even little, be a little bit self-indulgent and that's okay. 
Um, and, and that's something we also need to prioritize. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm just blown away by the folks that I get to work with every day because they show up and they show up for kids in a way like we've never seen, I think, in our profession before. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. And, and Dan, what, I mean, with that context, like what kind of advice are you giving your school leaders and what kind of coaching, what are the tips that we should be spreading on YouTube today? Yeah, I just, I tell him to follow Tony on Twitter and listen to what he says. So, uh, but basically a lot of those same things, I think people, uh, specifically leaders, you know, that's, that's my niche and who I serve, uh, need to be reminded uh, to take care of themselves. Educators specifically are an incredibly caring and compassionate, right, group of people. And uh, they give, give, and give. Uh, Tony mentioned, uh, you know, running on your reserves on fumes. And something that I always uh, try to remind folks, you can't pour from an empty cup. So get, get full, right? And whatever, if that's... Uh, you know, joining some sort of group that is developing you or taking time out, you know, walking in nature, reading inspiring books, you know, maybe you have some sort of spiritual practice. And I think for leaders too, because uh, they feel the weight, they feel the heaviness and responsibility of the moment. Um, they feel like they have to always be on, right? And connected, but just like our devices, if that's how you uh, run yourself, right? There's going to be some tragic consequences. So it's just a it's a gentle reminder, a little bell that goes off, right? To say, come on, like, what are you doing to take care of yourself? And uh, really encouraging people that that's perfectly okay and absolutely appropriate. Yeah, and, and Dan, um, what, do you, what do you do to take care of yourself as you try to take the load of some of the concerns that you see? Because I think a lot of leaders here are, are experiencing that too, trying to absorb some of the, the tension people feel. Yeah, you know, and I didn't even realize how it was impacting me, Anthony, you know, leading leaders. And uh, then my wife was just like, you're not fun to be around. Ouch, right? Your partners, they are such a great mirror. And she's like, you're not doing what you teach. And I'm just like, dang it, you're on a roll. You know, what's your deal? How do I zip that lip? Uh, and so I took time off, right? Uh, I asked for help. And I took a little bit of time off. And then I went back to the basics, you know, so things I teach like your ideal week, right? What does an ideal day look like? You know, what are those routines and rituals to get you uh, rolling? And, and for me uh, specifically, uh, I love just hiking in nature, you know? So, and I habit stack as well. Uh, so, you know, right after lunch, I'm gonna go outside, at least walk around and hike for a mile or two. And I use that time to really, uh, uh, you know, engage in deep thought and try to problem solve as well. I'm disconnected. I don't bring a device. I don't bring any, you know, AirPods, anything like that. So it's just, that's, that's one thing that really gives back to me. Great. And, and I think that's um, perfect for the next question I have, which is, you know, we're in December, we're going to be going into 2021 pretty soon. And we all have these great hopes for 2021. <laughs> and what I'm curious about is, um, what's something you learned this year that you want to carry into 2021? You're like, God, that's so obvious. We have to like work on this, or we have to do X, or we can't let go of this because this is something that we learned. What's, what is that big takeaway that we need to carry with us into 2021? And I'll, I'll start with Alex on that. He's like drat. Yeah, drat. Uh, I might need a second, Anthony. I need to reflect on that question. All right. You want to go second? Yeah. I can All take right. that. I All right. Tell. Um, yeah, I, I think the, what I really want to want to take forward, and I think it's also relevant for, for this audience, is just how much we really need to support our educators. Um, and you know, it's a, a variety of different components, right? We just talked about kind of their, their own mental health and their own emotional support, but also, um, you know, just thinking about uh, how they had to kind of be heroic during this time, even learning the technology. So what, am I, what I'm excited about is we now we have a whole kind of new generation of um, educators who are familiar with technology because they, had to, they were forced to be familiar. Um, but I still think we have a lot, long ways to go in terms of supporting and, and continuing to enable that. 
Um, I saw this firsthand with my mom. Like I said, she was a professor. Um, overnight, she had to take her class and put it all on Zoom. She had no idea what to do. Um, so during the week, my, my dad basically was her IT consultant while she tried to run her classes. But now, you know, now she feels comfortable. And she was like, I could see, you know, doing some type of hybrid where I can now teach online classes. I feel more comfortable with a lot of, t- with a lot of the technologies. So I'm just grateful for that. Um, but my hope is also that we as a society have a greater appreciation for educators. And I, and I think because, you know, parents had to become part-time teachers, um, there is a bigger awareness of, of how hard this job is and how hard um, our educators work. And, and I think that, um, but now I would like to see some more kind of policy driven decisions or, you know, we need to pay educators more, but I think that at least going to 2021, 20, there's a greater awareness. And I'm, I'm just hopeful that we continue to uplift the teaching profession. Thank you, Chantel. Alex? So this is definitely from the higher ed perspective. Uh, I mean, I think my parents were both K-12 educators, retired, and uh, I started my career as a high school math teacher. So I just have unbelievable admiration and I actually have 14 year old twin boys right now. So I've seen it from all sides for the work that you guys are doing. I don't think there's a, a besides working at a hospital, I think there's tougher work than working in K-12 right now. Um, you know, last April, uh, all our kids internships got wiped out across the university. And the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences came to me and said, hey, is there something that we can do uh, for these students? And it, it basically starting in June. And in 36 hours, we spun up a program that we admitted students into 30 days later. Uh, if you, I mean, we're a big public institution, uh, our schools had never collaborated before. And you know, what really struck me, we kind of took a risk, like we spun up a program during a time where we were converting 4,400 classes over to online because we really didn't have a lot of online capability. And we were doing it because it really met a student need. And we didn't know how students were going to respond, but we, we really tried to target that need. And we had this huge outpour of interest for this program. And so it was really interesting at a time when it felt like the world was going totally sideways to start playing a little bit of offense with some new programs. But in a way, that's really, really squarely meeting a need that students had. Like they didn't know what they were going to do and and everything was getting wiped out and they were looking for something. And um, it it was just a good lesson for me because there was a moment I was like, you know, should I do this? Should I come up my school to this program? There's 50 other things we should be doing for students and families uh, besides this. But, uh, you know, as long as we kind of paid attention to you know, the, the, the core needs of students, we're able to do some really innovative, creative things, really even during a crazy time. And so I hope to take that into next year even more that as much as we're trying to, you know, do all the basic blocking and tackling, are there ways that, you know, we can really, in, 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 you know, strategically and in pointed ways, you know, make some bets that, you know, really help students uh, move forward. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially coupled with what Chantel said, because, you know, I think Reach Capital has access to a lot of people who want to do things and change things and innovate and, you know, have that desire. And then you're in a condition where that hasn't been the norm. And now they've been forced to have those experiences. So it's nice to see that coupling of like how it's possible for anybody to have that kind of motivation if they were put in the right condition. So Dan, what do you, what do you think you want to carry into 2021? I'm uh, always inspired by all the stories of uh, students and even educators who weren't successful in school uh, prior to the pandemic, who thrived during the pandemic. And it's like, whoa, so maybe it didn't, you know, it wasn't working, which, you know, most people know that it didn't work for everybody. One size fits all. And so how do we differentiate even more? and get very creative about what this offer is and what the purpose is. Uh, Cause to see those guys and gals, right? Like just do wonderful things and leap and stretch in ways that, you know, they didn't know was possible and their leaders didn't see it in them. Uh, that's amazing to me. So I want to keep that. Absolutely. Yeah. That Dan, that's so true. Like I, I think even at, at elements, like we noticed that, within our own organization in these conditions like some people really prospered and did well and you know were willing to try a bunch of different things and 
and, and because it was different than what was normal. And so I, I see that in other organizations too, where in this condition, like they're super successful and maybe they weren't, you wouldn't have considered them necessarily the person that would have been the most successful in prior situations. So I think looking for that is really important. Um, Tony, how about you? What do you, what are you seeing at, from a district perspective and just from a leadership perspective, you need to carry through. So I, I wanted to say first on a personal note, what I, what I learned through this situation, this ongoing pandemic and a lot of quarantine time is that I actually like my family. I love, I, love, I love my husband and my son. They make me happy. And we've actually enjoyed a lot of these moments where we couldn't see other folks and we couldn't go places. So uh, I, as cheesy as that sounds, it's sort of redefined our family in a way that feels so great and so small and so ours. And I don't want to lose that. Um, personally, um, but I do think that that sort of finds its way professionally too, because for me, um, this pandemic has allowed me to get to know people in a different kind of way, because I've had to have conversations with folks who are struggling with mental health issues, who are struggling with underlying health issues, who are struggling with managing life and work. And so it's allowed me to, from my vantage point at least, recenter the person that I'm working with in this work and reminding me that they are a person first and an educator second, right? And so, and who they are in the classroom or who they are in their building is very much affected by who they are outside of that space. And so in the spring through the fall, we have people who are working within life or death situations because you could get sick and someone could die from this virus and yet they keep coming back to work. And I don't, I don't wanna lose sight of that. I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that there are people um, you know, before us um, who are educators in our classrooms, but are people first. And so being aware of who they are, appreciating who they are, being empathetic towards who they are, um, I think is, is critical. And then just as a practitioner, as an educator, the, the one last thing I do wanna share, this notion of failure is something I feel like we talk a lot about in education, yet at least from my lens at the K-12 continuum, we're very much outcomes base, right? Especially in the upper grades. It's about grades, getting grades, performing well, so you can get to that next level, get into that special class, and then get to college. So how do you expect educators to take risks and, 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 and experience and embrace failure when we're driving everything by scores, right? Whether that's standardized test scores or grades in the classroom. And I feel like this moment has, a, has put failure at the center because it's okay that the Zoom link didn't work. It's okay that your internet crashed. It's okay that Pear Deck didn't do, I don't know what Pear Deck does, but I imagine it does something cool on, in technology, <laughs> um, but that it didn't work, right? And those things happened in the moment with kids sitting before us, with administrators sitting before us, and it was okay. And there was space to actually fail. So let's take that with us, whether we're back in the classroom, whether we're hybrid, whether we're virtual, and really allow for failure so that we shift the focus from an outcomes-based system to a relationship-based system that is about learning and about growing. So, kind of Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I feel like uh, Michael talked about humanization, and I think all of you guys brought a lot of themes around just humanizing the people we work with and, and the colleagues that we have and how that's so essential for us to be successful. Um, yeah, you know, I, I feel like that's a consistent theme and I, I think we'll continue to see it through the rest of the, the day today. The, and, you know, I, I like your idea of like the opportunity to fail. I think I, I consider it the opportunity to be less perfect. Uh, you know, I think that there's a thought that like teachers and leaders need to be perfect all the time and they can't make mistakes. And, uh, I think this is an opportunity where we see uh, opportunities to make mistake and it's okay. And so maybe I'm going to be making a mistake right now when I ask you this next question, and which is, um, and I, Alex is going to get a kick out of this one. I think what we also do is we close every session with what's called a checkout question. And it's also a reflection sometimes. And my reflection question for you is, what's something education elements has done over the last 10 years where you're just like scratching your head going, did they really do that? Or you're like, I can't believe they just did that. Maybe you don't know us well enough, uh, but if you can come up with something or you just come up with something where you saw something happen in education, you're just like scratching your head as to how that even made sense. Anybody wanna go first? I think I can go first. Oh, wow, Chantel, <laughs> double down. 
I, 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 again, I knew education elements, again, back when it was um, an early software tool. Um, and I remember when they made, or you guys made the transition more to um, kind of more uh, change management, more consulting. And I was like, wait, software company offering more services. And, you know, in our head is like, oh man, you're going the wrong direction. You can't grow. This is not going to scale, you know, and, and I, all these questions like came up and it was totally the right move. It was totally the right thing. Um, again, as I, as I talked about what we feel like teachers really needed is like, they didn't just need another tool. They didn't just need another piece of software. They needed the support systems to really understand how to implement that on a day-to-day -day in the classroom. They needed the change management. District leaders need to say, how to actually implement not only the, the, the technology, but from a program perspective, from a curriculum perspective, how do, how do I make all these different pieces fit together? And again, it goes back to it required high touch, you know, human interaction. Um, and I do think, you know, looking back, it was the right move, but I remember thinking, why are we pivoting this business from software to services? And so um, it, was, it was interesting, but definitely the right move looking, um, reflecting back. Thank you. And there were a couple of board members that were scratching their heads too at me when we did that. So thank you. I want to just say that while I'm not necessarily that familiar with the work that that education elements does, I'm still learning about it. One thing that I do know, especially as I've had some time with Anthony, I appreciate the fun and the joy that you bring to the work um, and, and how you focus that as part of the learning because um, that gets lost, right? So easily um, and, and you don't let it get lost. Anthony, you definitely don't let it get lost. Um, and, and I have that tremendously, but even just looking at your Twitter feed and looking at the things that you spotlight and, and the fun that you bring to the work because the work can often just feel like work and it doesn't feel like that from, you know, experience that I've had and I really, prioritize that, that sense of joy and fun if we can in our schools. So I appreciate that about, about your work. Thank you. Yeah, I can't say that I, I know the work well enough yet. We are just developing a relationship. So the head scratcher for me is how do I get on the panel? You know, let's, <laughs> let's pivot and turn it, you know, all about me. And that triggers the imposter syndrome and all that kind of stuff. And so you know, the encouragement that I want to leave folks with and um, uh, yeah, is just to, to lean in, right? You, everybody here is more than enough. Uh, everybody has some sort of zone of genius and to lean into that and just be yourself uh, and offer it and, and you'll leave the world, I believe, a better place. Thank you, Dan. And Alex. So a little bit slower to Chantel. Uh, I have a good friend who says, that there are no silver, bullet, silver bullets in education. There's just 101% solutions. And when you guys moved into the change management work, I was like, man, that works really, really hard, but it's so, so important. And uh, you know, the fact that you guys were willing just to get in the arena and do that work and stand with your partners, because it is messy and it's not linear and there's just a million million things to do um and and uh you know stakeholders to manage and families to serve and it's just uh, i just really admire that you guys did that um there was a while where i'm like why is anthony writing so many books uh and i, I could really figure that one out but uh, uh I, I, I assume i assume uh there's the community has grown uh, it's it's been uh, it's been helpful doing that <laughs> well i mean also i think alex you know enough about me you're like can you write a book? Like I didn't even think that I could at the time, and so uh, was I was able to. I think Yeah, but um, I think you know I appreciate what you said, and actually, if there was a happy hour after this, you guys would hear a lot of the real stories that Alex has on me and and the organization. And there have been some fun ones where we got to do haikus at, at the South by Southwest panel. And we, we really, like I think Tony said, in those times we work together, try to show that uh, there's a lot of fun in this work that while you could be serious, it's also important to have, have fun because it's, it's really tough work that you all are, are doing every single day, uh, getting uh, you know, a, a lot of eyeballs and attention and critiques. Uh, and anytime you try to do one thing, someone has a different opinion about what you should have done. And so it's, it's a real struggle to maintain uh, composure in this work, I think, sometimes, uh, and allowing yourself to, you know, uh, relax a bit is, is really essential, in my opinion. 
All right, Dave, what's next? So first, I, I want to just jump in and say thank you to this wonderful panel. Um, and the moderator was all right, uh, but this panel was tremendous. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, more than anything, uh, Anthony, just hearing them speak so glowingly about Ed Elements is a testament to you and the work you've done, but also just the importance of the work that's being done across this country by so many people. So again, panel, thank you so very much for being here and for your words, greatly, greatly appreciated. We're gonna shift gears in a second to a video, but before we get to the video though, Anthony, I just wanted to ask you a few questions since you were asking all the questions. And what? I, yeah, I, just a couple of minutes, it's only fair. It's all only right. Fair. So first question I have for you, you know, I heard, you know, you've, you've written some books and people are like, are you gonna keep writing these books? Like, so now I'm curious. Is there another book coming? If not, what would you title it if you were thinking of a book? Ah, uh, so I'm going to answer that question by not answering it. And um, I'm actually not working on a book. I'm working on a documentary because that's my new thing, right? So I don't know if you guys know, but uh, I moved to Las Vegas a couple of years ago and I've been studying what's been going on with uh, schools in Las Vegas. And there have been a couple uh, micro schools pop up in, in the state. And when I was talking with the local uh, legislators, one of the things we, well, I first noticed when I moved to Las Vegas is it's, it's truly a 24 hour city. Like I know I need a haircut, but like I could get a haircut in Las Vegas at two o'clock in the morning. I could get a full meal at two o'clock in the morning. I could, my wife could get her nails done at one o'clock in the morning. Like you could do, you could live your life at night. And so I was like, what happens to those kids? And so I, I've been pondering this idea around what a 24 hour school might look like. If we could create an opportunity for students to learn 24 hours a day, whether it's in person, online, through advisory, some kind of supported system, doesn't have to be the way we imagine a bus coming to a building. What would that look like and how would we create the best possible experience? And I think it's a combination of some micro-schooling opportunities, some online opportunities, some in-person opportunities, some where I learn academics online, but I get advisory support and mental health support. So it's a combination, but I'm calling it the, the tw open 24 hour school or the 20, I don't know, Alex might have a better name for me, but that's something that I've been thinking about and, I want to design it in Las Vegas because I feel like if we could do it in Las Vegas and design something that allows students to learn at any time, then we could we could scale it back and redesign it for any city in the country. I love that. And you know, thinking of that idea, I mean, there's a podcaster that happens to be on this panel could talk through and, and, and talk that up a little bit. An investor, there's an author that could help. I mean, there's a lot of folks here. I'm not, you know, not throwing this plug out for you shamelessly, you know, Venmo me later, no big deal. But I think there's some people that would be interested in that, that documentary in so many ways. So Anthony, now just thinking a little bit, you know, that's the future. I want to take you to the past for a second. Over the past 10 years, you've started, led this charge to really change and shape the way that we support schools. What is your favorite memory of the past 10 years? At each <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um... <laughs> so I, I think like one was, the first one that Michael described, when we saw that KIPP and Power School, you know, we did started designing that school in April and it launched in September. And then by January, we had results and Alex remembers looking at those results and, you know, in a school where funding was getting smaller, uh, we had 30 kids in a classroom and we were able to get third, you know, kindergarten kids doing third grade math. And in South Central LA, where it's 98% free and reduced lunch and kids going from 3% proficient to 98% proficient in one year and uh, becoming the eighth best elementary school in the state of California, like that's like one, that's the seed of like that memory that gives me hope 
that we could do great things in education with the right practices and the level of discipline that allows us to do it. And it didn't require uh, some sort of superhero. It didn't require a super technology. It just required uh, discipline around looking at data and differentiating instruction. And when, when a lot of folks have asked me in the past to um, recommend products for them, uh, my, my recommendation was to use products teachers used hmm. because if uh, what we found in the research that we did early on is there's a lot of great tech products out there, uh, but oftentimes they're implemented poorly. And if they weren't utilized and teachers didn't go in and actually use them, then they didn't, they didn't get the results, no matter how good the product itself was. And so for me, you know, from a professional standpoint, having those belief systems around what works and what doesn't is kind of the fond memories that I have on a, on a personal side and uh, on the fun side. I mean, we, we throw some incredible summit parties. And so all of those times where we got together with all of the educators and school leaders that we worked with and got to um, ha create those memories together yeah. where we were laughing. Uh, I do dance a lot better than Michael Horn. So we were dancing and we were doing things that like really created the shared memories that we always wanted. Uh, and it, that created that community that is so special about the organization. And, and that's something that, yeah, we sadly missed in 20 this year. Yeah, wow. And, and it has been a year, um, but I think what's greater than this year is the fact that there's been 10 years of excellence with education elements. And it's clear through what you just articulated from it's starting from a seed to blossoming to something wonderful and beautiful and fun and joyous in so many ways to help schools is really, really powerful. To that point, we actually have a video of some of our partners speaking to those very facts. So I'm gonna turn it over to our team to share that video from some more of our partners. Congratulations, Ed Element, on 10 years. Congratulations on 10 years. Learning with Ed Element has been transformational. We've not only been able to work on personalize our learning experiences for students, in addition, personalizing our systems for principals and teachers, too. I appreciate the experts, individuals who've been around the work, who are able to come in and support us tremendously. Big shout out to the New York team that's been there from the start. You've made me a better staff developer. You've made me more aware of how to connect with people and to meet their needs. What Ed Elements did for us was give us the opportunity to create opportunities for personalized learning inside of a regular teacher classroom. Going into COVID-19, which no one knew was coming our way, that really set our teachers up for success. I thank you so much. Cheers to 10 more years, guys. I truly value the work that we do together. Thank you, Ed Elements. Amazing, amazing words from some of our tremendous partners. And it's only fair that we have partners that we've seen from afar through video, but I feel like our studio audience should also have a chance to share, you know, just a tidbit of how they feel about us. So in a second, I would love to see the faces of all of our studio audience if possible. And studio audience, as we make this, I want you to think of just one word, one word to describe your experience with EE. So as our studio audience is coming to the screen, I am I'm excited to see their faces and I see so many smiles across the board. And it's one of those things as a former teacher, when I asked a question like that, I looked for the person that put their head down first, so I didn't call on them. So it's good to see most heads are still up and looking at me, which is amazing. But I wanna go across my screen uh, with Dr. Mozingo, if you could share one word and then Suzanne, I'm coming to you next. One word, wow. Wow, wow, amazing, and we love them. I'm sorry, but we love it Element. I love it, Suzanne. Energizing. Love it, Dr. D. I think you're on mute, we don't wanna lose you. 
Inspiring. I love it. Justin. Innovative. Richard. Relevant. Kendra. Transformational. Amy. Family. Love it. Mike. Sorry, Mike, you were on mute. Empathetic. Love it. Sam. Relationship. Tony. Fun. Love it. Jana. People. People lovers. Yes. Ashley. Collaborative. Awesome. Alex. So me, Alex? Yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't know we were for this many. Uh, back of a rental car 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Fill up. Contextual, sustainable, impactful. Wow. I love it. I'm learning so much. I'm writing these words down. Christian. Committed. Shelly. I'd say ditto to everybody. <laughs> Chantel. Uh, community. Ellen. Together. Amy. Collaborative. And the man who dropped the wisdom of the zone of wisdom, Dan. Generous. Love it. Thank you all for sharing your words. And with those words, we're actually going to have the opportunity to hear some words of a former ee -er. She was the COO of Education Elements. Uh, she is currently the CEO of Alamo Draft House in Austin Cinemas for the Movie Lovers. Her career included senior leadership roles at Starbucks, Planet Fitness, the largest franchisee in the United States. But most recently, she was interviewed in the podcast <laughs> Masters of Scale with LinkedIn founder Reed Hoffman and CNN as the theater reopens safely and remains innovative. Anthony and Shelley, I'm going to turn over this conversation to you all at this time. All right. Thanks, Shelly. I mean, thanks, David. <laughs> Welcome, Shelly. <laughs> hey, um, Anthony. It's so, a good way to start. Yeah. And, and like, actually, this is uh, how, you know, when I invited Shelly, um, she was like, are you sure you want me to show up to your thing? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, she thought I was asking about the founder of Alamo Draft House. And the reason I, I really wanted to have Shelly here is because, you know, when I thought about her career experiences and how she went from Starbucks to Disney to Ed Elements to uh, Planet Fitness to where she is now, Alamo Draft House, I mean, she's had to reinvent herself along the way many times and drop into unknown conditions and uh, that's been fascinating for me to see. And, and I felt like there's some lessons there that we can learn in education that allowed her to actually do that with confidence. Maybe she doesn't feel like she has confidence, but from my side, I see a lot of confidence and the willingness to take on those challenges. And so uh, that's why I wanted to invite her because I felt like her sharing those stories would really resonate with some of the leaders that are listening in today. So thanks for joining us, Shelly. Um, we'll, I don't know, maybe just talk a little bit about your background because it's not, it wasn't only in the United States either. We met when you were actually operating in China. Absolutely. In fact, we met exactly like this via video and not so differently because um, I think it was five in the morning when you interviewed me and we met the first time and uh, was wearing pajama bottoms. And I'm literally wearing Star, Star Wars pajama bottoms because nobody knows anymore, right? And it doesn't matter. So uh, not planned, but here we are in the exact same circumstances. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, um, you know, first of all, just congratulations, right? I, I think about my time with you all and it was so fun. And, you know, actually where I learned how to learn um, you know, I think that we all think we're good learners, uh, and that's actually a skill unto itself. And I truly learned that from you and, and from education elements. And I think that's critical, um, especially when you think about moving from corporate environments to startups or, or smaller businesses. 
where the rules are not clearly defined and the industry may not be clearly defined um, and your ability to come in and, and be curious, ask good questions, but roll up your sleeves and learn is probably the most important skill. And, and it's actually the joy um, of making leaps like that. Yeah, and um, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering what what is something that was kind of delighted you or was different than what you expected when you came to Ed Elements, being that you came from uh, two organizations that had really small budgets, Starbucks and Disney, and <laughs> you know you just had so many resources and people to work with in at Ed Elements. Yeah, that actually was probably the best learning for me, right? Like I, I credit you all for today because coming out of big companies, I mean, I started with Starbucks when it was small. Um, you know, we had less than 125 stores, which I'm sure it's hard for anyone to imagine today. Um, but they're, they're highly structured by the time I, I got to you. So I knew how to work within really big organizations with lots of resources and how to get those resources and, and, and use them. And I think coming over to your team and, and eventually my team at the time, uh, you know, you learned how, I learned how to be scrappy. You know, I didn't have an assistant. I didn't have like all the luxuries that came with that. And, you know, part of that, I, one of the words, and I don't know who said it, but you said collaborative and, and that actually is true. Um, and I think that's how you do things on a small budget um, and small resources is you learn how to be highly collaborative and, and scrappy and think out of the box and not get caught in what you can't do and focus on what you can. Yeah, and I, I think also with like all of the organizations that you've been at, like I, in many ways, like the organizational identity is so specific, right? Like you could name what it's, it's like to be at a Disney employee or a Starbucks employee. And I, I even, you know, Alamo Draft House, I think there's a, a lot of character. If you haven't been, it's like one of my favorite theaters in the country. Uh, but what I'm curious about is like, how is organizational identity created? And what are, how did you evolve through each of those organizations in terms of how your identity has changed? Um, and what, I guess let's just start there. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think most cultures are started through the founder. You know, what's their idea and their passion and purpose um, and how do they imprint that? And the businesses that succeed um, or organizations that succeed, it's a founder who is passionate and can articulate and imprint. Um, you know, I think when people come on board, it's how do you bring your whole self and, and, and all the, you know, gifts that you can bring to that organization, but within that context um, and, you know, adapt to it because we're not there, we're there to help grow it, but not fundamentally change the identity and, and what makes it special. Um, and I think that that also comes back to, you know, having a curiosity and, and being willing to learn the nuances of the organization. And that's usually learning the nuances, not just of the core values and the mission and the vision, but the people and, and particularly those setting direction um, and, and fitting in. So like more specifically, like when you jump into a place like uh, Planet Fitness or Alamo Draft House, what are some of the, like the first steps that you take in order to figure out the identity and to help develop that within the organization so you could help grow and scale the work? Well, honestly, it starts in the interview process. I mean, I think a good interview process, you're asking those questions and you're learning um, through the interviews, but you're also doing your own due diligence. And, you know, now with the internet, you can Google stock anyone and, and, you know, really read articles and customer reviews and comments. And, you know, hopefully you've gone and experienced the product itself with Alamo is already a huge fan and, and really comfortable in, in what it was. But once you start, it's that willingness to do a lot of roles and learn how all the functions work and not just assume that you know, cause you've seen certain, you know, that type of production before. Um, and then it's spending time with all the people and, you know, in a pandemic that's more difficult, but with Zoom it's, you know, you still can do it. 
Um, and now that we do have some theaters open, I've, I've worked shifts, um, you know, and learned how to work in the kitchen. I've learned how to work, you know, in the theaters I've cleaned, um, you know, and I've spent time talking to our guests and, and really listening to them and, and, you know, what they believe our culture is. What, um, speaking of like, you know, working all aspects of the organization. And I, I think, you know, especially now with gyms and theaters and the, the challenges that they have, what, how, how are you guys executing on all this stuff? And how are you guys like in reinventing and what are some tips you would have for school systems that are trying to think about different ways of working that um, you've learned through your experiences in, with the gyms and theaters that you've supported? Yeah, and, and, and actually there's this huge parallels, right? Because it's the same. There's, I'm sure, a lot of work within school systems that can be done from home or remote. Um, and how, you know, how do you figure that out? And we can talk about that, but I'd rather talk more about the in-person um, because there's that experience. And I think, you know, a couple of things, we've completely reinvented everything we, we do. I mean, nothing looks the same. We've looked at you know, seating and, and buffers and two, you know, two seats between every set of guests, uh, wearing masks, temperature checks, you know, all the things that different organizations have done, but we took it even further. And I, I think about this for the school system and my own child who's in high school, um, you know, we thought about the kitchen and we reduced our menu so that we could social distance in the kitchen. And then we picked menu items that we could actually put in containers versus our plates and silverware. Um, you know, so that nobody was breathing on it and, and how we got that to the guests. We digitized, so we had an online ordering um, for tickets, but we had never done that for food. So now you can order online your food. You know, so we looked at every aspect and some of it's not perfect, you know, like we would have never wanted to stand up our online food ordering the way that we did. It's, you know, it's duct tape and twigs and, you know, everything we could find um, to do in a couple of weeks versus if we had had the time. Uh, but what we did is we never communicated a sense of fear. And I think that was really important. You know, this is a bit stressful and, and different, but we came out and talked about what we did do, um, our confidence in all the steps that we've taken. And then we've talked about choice. And, you know, again, for the school system, my hat's off when I look at our own, and I'm sure many of yours, is there were choice for students, whether they came back or they stayed home and remote learned, depending on their needs. And we've done the same within our theaters. Um, you know, we stood up an Alamo on demand, so our own streaming service. So we have a way to still give really cool content. Um, so people have choices, um, you know, creating as safe as you can, but choices of how to act in this environment. Yeah, which, you know, you mentioned Rory, your son, and I, I think that uh, I've seen him grow, grow up too uh, through this whole journey with, uh, since we've known each other. And I think with all of the organizations that you've been involved in, like customer service has been one of the top values that each of those organizations, including education elements, uh, has. And I'm curious, like, uh, as you raise your own child, what do you hope school, you know, the school district you work, your uh, Rory goes to, like, what do you hope from them in terms of uh, service level experience? Yeah, you know, I, I think when it when it's going really well and it does a lot you know obviously there's always room for improvement is it especially now they treat rory as the capable human being that he is and they put super high expectations um towards him and expect him to live up to him and you know he recently he's in his nine classes instead of eight he's in his junior year he's taking you know ib and and pre-algebra and whatever um, and loaded, overloaded in physics, chem, and I don't know, something else, uh, can't keep up with him. And he had to talk to his band and he dropped out of marching band at the end of the semester. And that could have been a tough situation, but what I loved is that the band director spoke to him as an adult, explain your decision, right? Critical thinking, um, you know, use your communication skills, but, you know, walk us through this and how you thought about it and why. And, 
um, you know, treated them the way that you, you would in, in, you know, at work, you'd, you'd have these conversations and they didn't call me and, and talk to me about it, which I super appreciate. And they came to a conclusion that, yeah, it was in his best academic interest to let go of band right now and focus on his academics. Um, so I think it's when the schools are set up to really enable students to take agency in their learning and make mistakes um, and learn, but also be successful is when it goes best, um, at least from what I've seen in my own household. Cool. And uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you for all the contributions that you've made to education elements. Uh, but I wanted to actually provide a um, more global thank you for everybody. And I, before I hand it over to Dave, um, I had a few words that I, I don't think our team knows about. So here we go. Uh, anyway, this is how, how we roll here. Anyway, um, you know, I, I think as Ed Elements becomes 10 and I became 50 this year, uh, I felt like I've grown so much. And I know some of you might think, well, he hasn't really grown up at all, but uh, I, I have in many ways. I feel like I understand something different, which is uh, it, life. a lot of life is about relationships and the connections that you make over the course of your career. And that's why I still remember some of the teachers that I've had when you know I was eight years old. So. So I think that was one learning. I think I wanted to uh, kind of categorize the different ways I think your engagement with Ed Elements changes as you have tenure. And so if you've been working with Ed Elements or worked at Ed Elements more than five years, I think that you'll really get to see the trust that we have in you, the honest conversations, the fun that we could have together and the hard conversations that we could have together so that we could look back and say like, we went on a journey together and you were a part of my life. And so that's like, you know, the, the five-year threshold, like you get to have those experiences. There are a lot of folks here, uh, Ashley and Richard and Amy, and where we, uh, Susie, we, Sam, we've had a ton of Kendra, like actually most of you guys, we've had these like long relationships where I just feel like Richard could just say whatever he wants to me. And I'll just be like, cool, you know, we could have those conversations and I could do the same. We could have those honest conversations. And it's so invaluable to have those in a relationship like this. If you're in the two to five year range, um, I also want to thank you for all of the trust that you've had, but hey, sometimes we're just getting our kinks out. Like we're still trying to figure things out and get to know each other in that way. And you're still trying to appreciate our quirkiness, like how informal we might be. The fact that, you know, you might see me in the same t-shirt for five days in a row, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, I, I think that what I could commit to you though, is that we will put dedicated effort into a, common understanding of each other. And we will really get to know you as best we can. And we hope that we commit to these have, having a longer term relationship. And then I think if you've been working with us for less than two years, one, thank you so much for choosing Education Elements. It's an honor and such a privilege to be able to work with you at, at Elements or in, with you as a district partner and a school partner. And what I, I know is that what you could expect from us is a human connection, one that we bring our whole self and we hope you bring your whole self because that's the only way we're gonna get this work done together. And what I hope is that we find ways to invest in each other in ways that we could grow, evolve and learn. So again, thank you and Dave. Shelby, thank you. Shelby, thank you and Dave, please. One, thank you, Shelly, so very much. Anthony, thank you for the words you just shared. I, I think they not only hit home for me, but I'm sure they hit home for so many folks that are part of this celebration as we celebrate 10 years together. And something that you said, Anthony, that still sticks out to me is that um, earlier in the conversation, you were talking about 
how hard, how much harder it's becoming to find the truth. And I think that truth is um, in the work that we hope to lead with you and, and really committing ourselves to finding the root of your challenges and the supports we can provide to you while having fun. And speaking of fun, it's only fair that as a father of two boys that I have a couple dad jokes that are, uh, you know, coming from, you know, the fact that we were sending some swag out to folks. So I have to say, basing my dad joke ability and the wonderful swag that we sent out, I just do not know what we would do without you because we, there's no way we can erase the good times that we've had together because Kendra, it has been so much fun. And the fact that we really appreciate that uh, you popped over. Popcorn, Shelly, am I doing all right? Popcorn, uh, to celebrate with us. Because uh, as we think about this journey and think about the wonderful work uh, that we have seen you all just develop over time, we are lucky to be a part of that journey with you. So if you can indulge me one last time though, and just show 10 fingers for 10 years, uh, to the screen so we can all see everyone's hands up with 10 because these 10 years uh, with you have created us. So we thank you so, so very much for being a part of this. And we have one last surprise, one last video to show you how much you really mean to all of us. Thank you, Suzanne. students have really grown with being able to take ownership of their learning. Every single training that my teachers have been in, they feel like it's tailor-made for them and it's addressing their needs. Working with Education Elements, the big piece for us is they're helping us with a national lens. You know, 2020 has been a year unlike any other. COVID-19, of course, no one was prepared for it. And as we thought about how we were going to re-enter our schools in the fall, it was amazing a blessing to have Ed Elements to design a process and a plan that we could use to move forward. The guidance, uh, facilitation, background work, guiding questions that we received from Ed Elements made all of the difference on our reopening playbook here in Western New York. We've been working with Ed Elements for about four years now, not only with personalized learning, but also with the responsive practices work that we are doing with our administrative staff. That really set our teachers up for success in dealing with COVID-19. Education as Elements has also provided some of the best professional development and professional growth that I've been a part of in making sure that we're building healthy habits aligned to student achievement and growth. The residual effect of the changes is a more openness between the building administration or departmental heads to the department. We are now able to grow within ourselves and in turn then grow our organization that we work with. So we've not only been able to personalize our learning experiences for students and systems for principals and teachers too, with systemic structures in terms of coaching support and resourcing principals. They have enabled us to build stronger, more cohesive systems that have also built ownership and alignment in our staff, which is really critical to us. I so appreciate the way that you prepare and bring new ideas and really be a thought pusher and a thought provoker. We knew we needed work on leadership and we knew that at Elements were the experts on P-learning and we couldn't become better at P-learning unless we developed our leadership to become experts as well. The personalized learning component has given our students a sense of ownership and engagement in the teaching and learning process like never before. And not just student engagement in the digital content or with the device, but more student engagement with the teacher. Kids were talking about what they were learning and the classroom management concerns that we had before were nil. Education Elements has been really helpful in thinking through all of the planning, all of the rollout, the timing, the messaging. They help us stay on track. They help us stay focused. 
and they're responsive to our needs. The two big things we did were hold community forums and then community planning meetings. And then data collection and data gathering that we did and at Elements did to determine what is the district about? What are the things going on in the district? What, where do we need to focus? It's the first time that I, as a teacher, have been able to collaborate with other districts. Everybody wants to be better than they are. And the only way to do that is to network and to talk with other folks in your profession. This situation of having other districts to collaborate with is kind of like having a teammate on a basketball team or any organized sport. You might be fabulous as an individual player, but when you have a whole team of people who are fabulous, you're gonna make it to the championship. And that's our goal to ultimately have just districts full of winners.